Hi everyone, welcome to Simon & Schuster from home. I'm Simon Huck, I work on our corporate digital marketing team at Simon & Schuster. And I'm here today with New York Times bestselling author, Jen Weiner, and my colleague from Atria Books, Dana Trocker. I don't know where on the screen she is. Um, but we're here today to chat about Jen's book, Big Summer. It is the ultimate summer reading book, the perfect book for your bookcation. So before we kick things off, what, really quick, I want to talk about a couple of housekeeping things. I'm going to be looking out for your audience questions and we'll be sharing them with Jen so we can answer them live here today. And another great thing that we have for you guys today is there is the ultimate staycation sweepstakes, which you can enter today. Today is the last day to enter. We've dropped the link for that in our comments, or in the post copy, rather. Um, and we'll also drop it in the comments as well. So that'll be a great prize to win. And like I said, today's the last day to enter. So make sure you enter for your chance to win right now. <laughs> and we also have a lovely book club kit. So if you guys want to talk about this book with your book club, we've got some great resources for you. We'll also be sharing that link for you to be able to access. And on that note, I'm going to hop off camera <laughs> and kick things on and, and, and hand things over to, to Dana. So over to you, Dana. Hi, Saima. See you later. <laughs> See you later. I'll be back at the end. All right. Um, Jen, so we have gotten a chance to talk a couple of times in the recent months. And we're all really excited about our um, bookcation, which is vacation is wherever your book is. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought since everyone is having some like Zoom fatigue, Mm -hmm. that we would try something kind of different this time to make it really fun. So sure. we're going to ask you some rapid fire getting to know you questions. Wonderful. Wonderful. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm okay. ready. Jennifer Weiner. Yes. What is your favorite food? Cannoli. What is your favorite color? Green. Me too. What is your favorite holiday? Uh, Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> I, what? Why? I just that just blurted I, I I honestly what it is it's break the fast at Yom Kippur which I host every year mm -hmm. and everybody thinks I'm the most amazing cook in the world but basically after you've been fasting an entire day anything tastes amazing that is my hostessing secret host break the fast yeah, it's yeah. great the gratitude for yeah. literally anything that you eat you put on bagels and locks and they act like you're this like Martha Stewart combined with Rachel Ray combined with Julia Child. Like it's, it's just amazing. So yeah. bagel sounds great right now. Yes, right. Oh. All right. Uh, you know, great right now. What's your favorite cocktail? Um, I like a margarita. Yep. Classic. Uh, your favorite season. Fall. Also classic. Favorite TV show? Um, oh God, so many. I'm watching Dark right now, which is streaming on Netflix. It's this German post-apocalyptic science fiction time travel show. It's mm -hmm. awesome. It's great. Good. Uh, if anyone else is watching that, tell us in the comments uh, yeah. what you think. Don't make me feel like I'm the only one watching things like subtitled from the German. It's weird. I, I like things, this is totally off topic. I like things where um, you have to pay attention. Like you have to read the captions because then I can't like be futzing on my phone and like. Yes, yes, right. Now you can't be like listening and then doing something else. You have to be like listening and watching. And every once in a while, like I'll catch a word that I've like learned from the show, like the word for cave in German, because there's like the cave is where the time travel happens and they say cave a lot. So cave is like hule. I think something like that. Anyone speak German? Anyone, anyone help? Anyhow, it's very good. I love that you're, I love that you're learning German from Netflix. I'm trying, man. I'm trying to improve <laughs> myself during the quarantine. Yeah. We're all going to be better when we burst out of quarantine. God. <laughs> um, inquiring minds want to know uh, your celebrity crush. Ah, um, Wow, that is that is an excellent question. Like I'm so bad at this stuff. Like I I loved Alan Rickman. <laughs> I, yeah. I like sort of a 
really like bad guy, like a bad brooding, you know, yeah. I'm going with my, the late, great Alan Rickman. Such a good actor. So good. Um, okay, if you could have a drink with one of your characters that you've written, who would you have a drink with? I would have a drink with Daphne. And, and then I would like make her like set up my whole Instagram and like run it forever. <laughs> oh my God, that would be so good. Wouldn't that be um, amazing? Like, I don't know what I'm doing at all. And, and I, mean, I need like to invent a character who can come like help. You did. Daphne is the perfect person to come and help. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And for those of you tuning in who have not read Big Summer yet, Daphne is the main character in Jen's most recent amazing, fun novel, Big Summer. And she is a social media influencer. And um, so that's why Jen wants Daphne's help on social. But okay. if you are also just tuning in and don't follow Jen on social. What are you even waiting for? Jen is great on social. She's on Twitter, she's on Facebook and she's on Instagram. So wherever you like to be, she's there. Wherever you are, there I am. You can't. <laughs> um, okay, who's your favorite character that you've ever written? That's oh, a hard question. Probably um, Peter, who is the love interest in Good in Bed and Certain Girls. Um, you know, he's sort of the dream guy and he was a lot of fun to write. Um, your favorite character that you didn't write? Wow, okay. So I love um, Jane Heisenhuber Cobley, who is the female lead of Susan Isaac's novel, Almost Paradise. Um, she is like wonderful and smart and spunky. And she's like this nice Jewish girl from Cincinnati with this like horrible last name. And um, she and her brother at some point joke that they're going to have a television show and it's going to be called the Heisenhuber Hauer. Not the hour, but the Hauer. You got to pronounce the H. So so good. Great character. And that's one of my all time favorite books. Awesome. Um, so here's a fun question. Mm -hmm. um, what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were a kid? I wanted to be a writer. Uh, oh. I wanted to be a writer. Yeah. I mean, I think there were maybe a couple of weeks where I wanted to be a ballerina, but you know, after that dream died a hard death <laughs> when I realized I was large and uncoordinated. And then all I wanted to do was be a writer. And now I am. It's pretty amazing. Dream come true. It is. It is a dream come true. I used to want to be a bird, but that's for another story. A bird? Really? Like what kind? Like a fancy bird or just like a little, you know, kind of regular? Like yeah, just like a little like songbird. I don't know. People, for years, people ask me and I would say, I want to be a bird. And um, I didn't see anything wrong with that. I, I still don't see anything wrong with that. Either. I think that's wonderful. I like birds. Um, so since it's your childhood dream come true, tell us about your path to becoming an author. Well, okay, so I was the classic, like, nerdy, um, I had, I, I like to say, a giant vocabulary and no friends when I was little, and I was always, always reading, and so I read my way through elementary school and through high school. I was an English major in college, because that was the major where you got to read all the great books, and I graduated in 1991, and there was a recession at the time. And one of my professors, you know, cause I, I wanted to be a writer and I had, I think approached by my parents who were like spectacularly divorced at that point. And I said, would either of you be interested in becoming a patron of the arts and supporting me while I write a novel about your horrible divorce and all the damage that it's done to me? And they were both like, yeah, no, that's not happening. I mean, and the problem is like, you can't get hired as a novelist. Like I, I looked very closely at the classified ads and nobody was hiring novelists. And so I became a journalist. I went to work for a small newspaper in central Pennsylvania, then a larger newspaper in Lexington, Kentucky, where I was for about a year. And then I moved to Philadelphia because I got a job at the Philadelphia Inquirer. And it was wonderful training for becoming a novelist because you learn to pay attention to detail, you learn to listen to dialogue, you sort of see how people are in the world, how the world works. 
And all that time that I was working for newspapers, I was writing fiction in my spare time. I was writing short stories and pieces of novels and things, screenplays and things that never got published, things that never got optioned. But I worked and I worked and I worked. And um, then I got my heart broken when I was about 28. And I decided that I was going to tell myself a story as a way of getting over this heartbreak. I was going to tell myself a story where the girl was a lot like me and the guy was a lot like Satan and the girl got a happy ending. And that became Good in Bed, which was my first novel, which was published almost 20 years ago in 2001. Wow. Yeah. Oh, right. We have our anniversary next year, 20th anniversary. I know. It's like the 20th. Like, what is that? I believe, I, I, is that some sort of jewelry that, that I'll be getting from someone? I'm sure it's like, it's like paper or like linen. I haven't <laughs> been through paper and linen because like, I think like your third anniversary is cotton, I think. So I, I found like cotton balls, like a bouquet of cotton balls for my, my husband, my beloved husband. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Well, we're definitely going to celebrate um, the anniversary of Get In Bed next it's year. It's going to be so awesome. It's going to be very readers, cool. Readers, stay tuned for that. Yes. Um, and readers also uh, tell us uh, what you wanted to be when you grew up. Yeah. Um, sure. Let's and talk about some aspirations. Yeah. I always like hearing people's stories about like how they got where they are, especially because I have kids now and it's it's like so interesting to listen to them talk about what they want. Like my, my 12 year old has decided that she's either going to be a teacher or a therapist because she's like, I think that I like people and I like to hear about their problems. And I'm like, okay, that sounds good to me. And then the, the grumpy teenager who lives and breathes Broadway wants to be a stage manager. Um, but I think she might be a writer. I think oh, that oh my gosh I know right like I can't say it because then it's like mom you know stop telling me what to do and stop stop pressuring me so I can't I can't say a word but she is a very talented funny writer I love and, that she is like rebelling against the family business but the family yeah. business is like everyone's dream job <laughs> <laughs> Her, I'm like, this does not suck, but she, you know, she wants to work on Broadway. And I will, you know, if that's her path, if that's what she winds up doing, like I will not deny her. I will go see her shows. I I will send her helping checks so she can live in Manhattan, you know. I'll be a good mom. You'll be the patron of the arts. Well, yes, I will be, I will be the patron of the arts, but I, let me tell you, like, it is so hard to be like a theater mom of a kid who's never on stage because I go to the performances and, you know, all of the other parents, like their kids are acting. It's like, that's my kid. That's my daughter. That's my son. I have to wait until intermission when my daughter dressed all in black comes scurrying across the stage to like move the props around. I'm like, that's my daughter. And I stand up and I start taking pictures and she gives me like the scorching stink eye, like the stop breathing, stop existing, you're embarrassing me. And I'm like, that's my kid. So she's like, I'm supposed to be invisible. That's why I'm all in black. Exactly. Like I'm not, well, you know, like you're not supposed to notice, but I notice because that's my child. And I'm like, you know, they, they did a performance of Marie Antoinette at her high school last year. And I'm like, she built the guillotine <laughs> and I'm so proud. And I, I, I think all the parents are a little afraid of me now, but what can I do? I my love kid, My kid. I'm That's so my proud. kid. Um, okay. So more questions. Yeah, I think it's time that we, I mean, this has been my favorite Facebook live ever, but I think we should let the viewers know a little more about big summer. Would you like to walk us through a no spoiler version i would love to give you a no spoiler and no curse word version i was uh reviewing my marching orders before we got started and it's like no cursing and i'm like did i curse during one of these like did i did so well i'm going to be very careful okay so big summer big summer is the story of daphne berg who is a 28 year old woman who is living in new york city She's getting over this moment of humiliation that went public and went 
viral. She's trying to put the pieces of her life back together and figure out who she is and what she wants to be. And she is starting out sort of taking baby steps into the world of Instagram influencing. She is a, she's working sort of in the plus size influencer space. So she does like her outfit of the day and she does like workout gear and yoga mats. And, you know, she's just getting to the point where she finally has more followers than her dog's Instagram account. When back into her life comes her former best friend, Drew Kavanaugh, who was a high school frenemy, a rich, privileged, mean girl. And she and Daphne have had like the friendship breakup. They haven't spoken in years. And Drew comes back and she says, I know that I treated you badly. I'm getting married on the Cape and I want you to be there. I want you to be in my wedding. I cannot imagine getting married without you. You were the best friend I've ever had. And Daphne's first impulse is to say hells to the no. But she thinks it over and realizes that if nothing else, a long weekend on the Cape will give her a chance to like meet some cute groomsmen and like have some fabulous backgrounds to take her Instagram pictures. So off she goes to Cape Cod and it's this over the top, crazy, ridiculous wedding. And there's the rehearsal dinner party on the beach and there's this great, all this great food. And she does in fact meet a cute guy. And then things take a turn and Daphne winds up having to spend some time investigating the truth of her friend's life and answering some tough questions about her own life and the, the direction that she's going in terms of the internet and in terms of what is virtual and what is real and what is performance and what is authentic. So lots of some big issues, big sort of philosophical questions in what I hope is a really fast paced, fun, you know, fizzy, frothy, beachy, sexy, delicious, take it to the pool, take it to the backyard, take it to wherever you're going to relax during this horrible, horrible summer. <laughs> I think that's such a, that's such a perfect way to sum it up because this book is so many things. It's like, thoughtful and explores some like really deep feelings about friendship and growing up. Um, but it's also really, really fun and has some jaw dropping left turn moments that we cannot spoil for those of you who have not read it. Um, it it's been really interesting because like, I think that there are people who pick it up, you know, it, thinking that it's going to be this, this fun, fizzy beach read and find that the passages about Daphne growing up as a fat kid and like being put on a diet at a very early age and being sort of made to feel ashamed about her body and her weight, like those are resonating really deeply with some of my readers, which, you know, I almost feel like I want to apologize. Like, I'm sorry, like I, I didn't, you know, th this wasn't like a bait and switch kind of thing, but the truth is, Anything that I write, like even if I set out to make it just nothing but fun and comedy and wit, there always ends up being, you know, there's stuff that I'm thinking about that works its way into the story. It sort of seeps up through the roots. And I think a lot about issues about body image and, and confidence and prejudice and the way that we judge each other and the ways that we treat each other. So, yeah, I mean, I think that what I hope that, what I hope for Big Summer, like I wrote it to be diverting and fun and I hope that it is diverting and fun. But I think this is a book that will meet you where you are. So if you're looking for fun escape, it's gonna give you that. If you're looking to think about what the internet culture is doing to our young women and, and really women of all ages, like it's certainly gonna give you some things to think about in that regard. And if you've ever had occasion to revisit an old friendship that maybe wasn't the healthiest friendship, I think that it will give you some um, food for thought about, about the ways that we choose who we're gonna be friends with and sort of envy and aspiration and, and 
the ways that the friends that we choose define how we see ourselves and what we want to be and what we want to do in the world. So there's some stuff. There's some stuff there. A lot there. Well, one of my other favorite things about Big Summer is that it's really transporting. And I feel like at this moment in, in all of our summers where we can't travel and, you know, a lot has been canceled, that this book really feels like escaping to the Cape and, in, and living in this kind of lavish world for a little right. while. Um, so I thought maybe we could talk about when things go back to normal in the world right. and we can travel. Mm -hmm. Is the Cape the first place you're going to go or where, where are you going to go? Well, so I turned 50 in March in March. quarantine. Yes. My awesome. birthday party canceled. My husband and I were supposed to go on a big trip to Alaska this summer. Like I've never been to Alaska and I want to see the glaciers before they melt. And, you know, we had this whole trip planned and we were going to go hiking and on a whale watch and kayaking and all that stuff. So I am very much hoping that our trip is going to be rescheduled and that I'm going to get to see Alaska at some point because I've, you know, never, I've, we've done trips to Paris and we've done trips to Italy, but I've never seen Alaska and I really want to. So Alaska. That's amazing. You're going to love Alaska. It is breathtaking. Right. Yes. Um, well, can we also talk a little bit about the Cape? Because I know it is really a special place to you. And it's like one of the two main settings of big summer. So I thought maybe you could like whisk us away there for just a, a minute of virtual vacation. Okay. So I grew up in Connecticut and Cape Cod was where we went for the summers. We would rent like a cottage in Truro, which is very close to the end of the Cape. It's the outer Cape. And we'd have a little cottage on the beach on the bay side, which is sort of warm and gentle. The ocean is freezing cold and you get some really nice waves. So if you like ocean swimming, there's that. And there's also these like little freshwater ponds on the outer Cape. So if you know where they are, you can drive there and park and like it's beautiful, clear, warm water. And you can just like swim across a pond. Um, one of the things that I like to do is I, I have my little dog Moochie and I put her in a little float and I like tow her across the pond because she'll swim out after me. So like if I don't keep her safe, like, you know, I, I went paddle boarding once and I like turned around I was like way out and I turned around and she's like swimming to come get me so gotta keep Moochie safe but yes yeah, she is loyal she's a loyal little girl but the thing that I love about Cape Cod is it's it's really has this unspoiled quality um they've taken a lot of care, I think, with like the zoning laws and sort of the environmental concerns about the dunes and like the septic system. So you can't have houses that are crammed together right next to each other. There's really strict rules about how much land you have to have in order to like build like a crazy big house. So there aren't that many crazy big houses. Like it's a very different vibe than the Hamptons and a very different vibe than the Jersey Shore. And there's a lot of artists who've ended up on Cape Cod, artists and, and writers. So there's like a very vibrant sort of culture. And then you get to Provincetown, which my kids say is the gayest place in the world. And I don't know if that's exactly true, but it's close. And there's drag shows all summer long. Like even before RuPaul's Drag Race was a thing, there would be drag queens doing shows in P-Town. And now all of the alums of Drag Race do their shows there. Like we saw Benda La Creme last summer, which was great. But um, it's just a very comfortable place for all kinds of people. It's very welcoming. It's very inclusive and like, there's a pride parade and then like carnival in August every summer. And it is just the most bananas over the top. Like the themes, like last year, I think it was like Greek God, gods and goddesses. And so like everybody was like, you know, half naked and silver body paint, like with big tridents because they were Neptune or they were Zeus or something. And 
you know, every float has a DJ and they're all like playing dance music. And it's just like a fun, embracing, like awesome place to hang out. And then you go to Truro, which is so quiet. And there's these gorgeous beaches and you they're just not people all jam together, which is good even in a pre-pandemic time. And you can just walk and just hear nothing but waves and seagulls. And it's my favorite place in the world. And I really hope that Big Summer gives people a little taste of that and a little bit of like the feeling that you're there and you're on Commercial Street and there's beautifully built guys wearing tiny little Speedos and nothing else. And you're eating a malasada and you can feel the breeze off the bay. I feel like I was there just for one minute. Um, that sounds amazing. And I think um, like particularly at this moment, reading a book that takes you somewhere to relax on a beach is just the biggest gift in the world. So um Readers, if you haven't yet gotten your copy, um, it's you know much less expensive than a plane ticket. <laughs> and who wants to get on a plane right now anyway? Um, meanwhile, readers, also, if you've ever been to Cape Cod, tell us in the comments your favorite thing about Cape Cod. Um, and if you are interested, um, Simon mentioned at the top of this Facebook Live that there's a book club kit. And in the book club kit, there is um, a guide to the perfect weekend in Cape Cod. So um, you're gonna wanna go ahead and get that. There's also um, some cocktail recipes. There's uh, <laughs> Daphne's famous banana bread recipe. And Jen, I don't know how you predicted it, but you put an amazing banana bread recipe in this book that came out in the moment that literally everybody went home and stayed home and made banana bread every week. So I'm basically the Nostradamus of baked goods. Clearly. Like I, right. I can see what the next thing will be. Not really, but I love banana bread and like, how can you not love banana bread? So yes, banana, bread, banana bread plays this very important role where the day that Daphne decides that she's done with diet culture, she's not going to try to diet anymore. She's going to eat to nourish herself and, and eat things that she wants to eat. And she makes, she bakes herself this fabulous banana bread. And of course I had to put the recipe in the kit because I think that, you know, how can you not read about that banana bread and not want to make it for yourself? I mean, it is amazing banana bread. Yeah, so that's pretty, highly recommended. Pretty there's also, I mean, there's lots of really sort of meaningful food in this book. Um, and part of it is Daphne's relationship with her father as expressed through their food adventures. And we also have in the book club kit, a guide to um, Daphne and her dad's New York. So all the places that they go on their eating adventures. Um, so lots of fun stuff there. And then one more reminder, uh, before we take some audience questions that Today is the last day. So if you're watching this live, you're very smart. Good job. Um, after we wrap up here, you're going to want to go enter the ultimate staycation giveaway. There's a link in the post. Um, and that is what we dreamed up to help you because probably you had a vacation that was canceled. So we put together the most luxurious, wonderful stay-at-home vacation box we could think of. It has fancy hotel sheets, room service, um, flip-flops, a cute bathing suit, a signed copy of Big Summer, a custom towel. What more could you want, people? It's so, um, so that's really fun. It ends today, so don't leave yet because we're about to do audience questions. But after we finish, you'll want to go enter that giveaway. So with, without uh, further ado, oh, Sima's going to uh, send us. Oh, she's going to come back. Welcome back, Sima. Come on back. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm back. <laughs> Figured I'd come back to, to start talking about these audience questions because we got a lot of great questions um, during your chat. So I'll kick things off with Lucille's question. She asked, how long does it usually take you to write a book? So that is a really good question. And the answer is 
nine months. Um, I used to joke back in my like fertile days that like, you know, nine months and at the end of it, like something was coming out, like either a book or a baby, something. <laughs> but generally like it's, you know, and it depends, like some books are much faster than others, like Big Summer. I think I must have had that plot in the back of my head for a long time because that book just like flew. Um, but generally it's like three or four months to get like a first draft, like to get the pieces on the page to sort of put up like this, the scaffolding of the house. And then you move things around and maybe you don't like that window and maybe you want to put an addition over there and maybe that door's not working. And you revise and revise and revise, which is my favorite part. Once you've got your pieces in place and you just get to like perfect it. Um, you know, my agent will read a draft and give it back to me with notes. My editor will read, it, read a draft and give it back to me with notes. And then they'll both read the next draft and give it back to me with notes. Um, and I've been working with outside editors too, who have been really, really wonderful in terms of helping me get the characters who are not white Jewish women feel as hopefully as authentic and as, as real and nuanced and complete as the people who are like me. So, you know, sensitivity readers, I am all for them. So nine months. Wow. Yeah. So Michelle asked, and I, I know I saw a couple other people ask this as well. Do you think any of your other books would be a TV show or a movie? Oh my God. I honestly, <laughs> So close to being able to announce something really, really huge along those lines. And I can't. So let me just say that if you are a fan of my early work, I think I'm going to have some really good news for you. And if you enjoyed Mrs. Everything, I think I'm going to have some news along those lines. And I'm very, very hopeful for Big Summer, too. I think that that's something that would work very well, you know, as a movie, as a miniseries. I think there's lots of possibilities and, and some interest. So stay tuned. I mean, I personally would love to see Big Summer on the screen so I can, like, feel like I'm getting away when I'm stuck at home. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, I'm very hopeful. And if you need another reason other than Jen is great at social media to follow, um, you'll be among the first to know when there's news to share. Yes. Absolutely. Make sure to follow Jen on social media. We'll add her um, social links here as well for you guys. So um, YM Nelson said, I love the fact that Daphne is a plus size model and you're telling these stories. Are there any characteristics or plot points that you don't like when reading stories that has a plus sized main character? That is a great, great question. Um, so back in college, I was lucky enough to take a creative writing class with Toni Morrison. And the famous Toni Morrison quote is, if there's a book that you need to read and it's not on the shelf, it's your job to write it. So when I began my career, I thought a lot about the books that I had read that had fat representation. And it was always one of just a handful of storylines. And the, the one that still kind of irks me is weight loss, right? Where like a fat character's entire self and entire journey is all wrapped up in her size and in trying to make herself smaller like that that makes me crazy and I know listen it's a part of life people go on diets it happens there's a billion dollar industry devoted to making sure that that happens but I like to have plus size characters who are just out there living their lives and they're getting married or they're having romances or they're doing yoga or they're going swimming. Um, and either they are living sort of comfortably and happily in their skin or they are learning how to do that, which that's the book that I needed when I was a young woman. And I think that there are still young women who need to see that story where it's not fat girl loses weight, then gets the guy where it's just, you know, fat girl stays fat and has adventures and a wonderful life. I think that's a great answer. <laughs> um, and then Amanda asks, do you like to read a different type of book 
than you like to write or do they normally coincide? That is a great question, Amanda. So I read everything. I read the books that are, you know, like mine. Um, I just finished Ellen Hildebrand's new one, which is fantastic. But I also read a lot of horror and a lot of science fiction and a lot of like what would be called like literary fiction. Um, and I read poetry and I read The New Yorker and I read nonfiction. Um, I read just about everything. And I think that that's important to me as a writer. I think people ask, you know, like I, I want to be a writer or my, my son or my daughter wants to be a writer. And I always say, I think the most important thing about being a writer is being a reader first, you know, and you have to like, I can always learn something from anything I'm reading, um, you know, and, and from television shows that I watch too. Like I learn about pacing and structure and character and all that stuff. So I read very widely and, and I have very Catholic with a small C taste. What book is currently on your nightstand right now? Okay, so I'm reading Ruthie Thorpe's The Knockout Artist, which is amazing and weird and delicious and different, and I highly recommend it. Um, and this summer, two books that I've been recommending a lot. I loved Curtis Sittenfeld's book, Rodham, which was sort of an imagining of Hillary Clinton's life if she had not married Bill. And I am rereading Stephen King's book, Salem's Lot, because I am working on the third book in my Littlest Bigfoot trilogy, which is my book books for young readers. And there's a scene where I need a kid to be tied up and trapped in a mansion and then escape. And there's a scene where that happens in Salem's Lot where a kid is being held hostage by like the, the vampire's evil henchman and he gets himself out of these knots and runs away. So I'm rereading it for that, but I haven't gotten there yet. So I'm, I'm <laughs> very close. So we're, we're running out of time, but I'm going to take two more questions. One's from, um, where is this? Uh, Beth asked, is Drew based on someone you know? Or are any of your characters based on anybody that you know? You know, there's always a little bit of someone or something in, in the characters that I know. Um, Drew is there's a little bit of sort of like some girls I knew in high school who were kind of like the pretty popular mean girls. Um, there's a little bit of Ivanka Trump in there. I think you will recognize certain mannerisms and um, perhaps facial changes in Ivanka. Um, you know, but the, the thing about fiction is like, even if you start off with like, okay, this character is a version of my mom, or this character is a version of my high school BFF, or this character is a version of the guy who broke my heart. By the time that you've been through all of that writing and rewriting and revising and revising and revising, if you are doing your job, if I am doing my job, those characters are characters. They are no longer, you know, the guy who dumped me or the girl who was mean to me in high school. They're their own people. But there are definitely elements of um, women I've known in Drew. And then the final question from Irene, she asks, who are some authors that have inspired you? Oh, uh, what a great question. Um, so Susan Isaacs, who I mentioned earlier, is like my all time favorite and inspiration. Um, Laura Zygman, who's a friend, I love her works. Um, I grew up reading Ann Tyler. I think I've read every book that Ann Tyler has written. Um, I've read every, I know I've read every book that Stephen King has written. And I think that he's great. If you, you know, just in terms of pure storytelling, he's a huge inspiration. Um, and I read Judith Krantz books when I was a young woman, those like sex and shopping and glitz and glamour and everyone is rich and fabulous books, which were lots of fun. Um, you know, and I, I just, I mean, I read a lot and there are people who are in like my automatic buy category and, you know, definitely Susan Isaacs, Definitely Ann Tyler. Um, I read Anne Lamott. I love to give bird by bird to people who are want to write, want to learn about it. Um, uh, I always, ugh, I should, I should keep the list like right beside me because I always get asked this question and I'm always like, eh, I don't know. But um, generally, if I'm reading a book and enjoying it, I try to 
mention that on social media. So if you're following me on Twitter or you're following me on Facebook, I'd like to give a shout out to the books that I'm enjoying. That's great. Well, thank you so much. And quick reminder for everybody today, we have a special sweepstakes. Today is the last day to enter to win. As Dana mentioned, it's got a lot of great things like some fancy sheets for your room, some flip-flops, a bathing suit, whatever you need to make your staycation the ultimate bookcation, even a signed copy of Big Summer. Um, we love reading here, obviously. <laughs> so a book is necessary for a staycation. Um, and we also have a lovely book club kit that comes with uh, Jen's wonderful banana bread recipe, as well as some great discussion questions that can help you with your book club. So all of those links are in the post copy and also in our comments in this chat. And we just want to thank you again, Jen, for, for joining us and spending your afternoon with us today. This is lovely. Thank you guys all for being here and good luck in the sweepstakes. And don't forget, you can join me on Twitter. You can join me on Facebook and Instagram. You can see pictures of my garden. I'm very proud. I have a watermelon now. So join on in and have a wonderful day and good luck and happy reading. <laughs>